Hi, my name is Johanna Jarko, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook University. So one of my primary research interests is trying to understand how the brain processes social interactions, and peer interactions more specifically. And when we think about peer interactions, we can commonly think about adolescence as being a time when those types of interactions are more important than almost any other time in, in one's life. And what's really interesting about uh, adolescence as a, as a time during development is that it's associated with this um, drive or almost a biological imperative to form more strong and complex friendships than people have ever formed before. And really when you think about uh, adolescence, we can think about the primary job of someone during that time period is to become successful at navigating their social world. One of the best ways to kind of figure out how well you're doing at this job is based on the type of, of peer feedback you get. So are the people around you your friends? Are they being accepting of you? Are they being rejecting of you? How is that kind of information coming in? And this is all very, very important to adolescents and becomes extremely salient. Unfortunately, at this very same time as this peer feedback is becoming so very important, there's an increase in the onset of, of social anxiety disorder. So what you have is a group of kids whose primary focus is really having these really successful relationships with their peers, but unfortunately they're for prevented from doing so because they've become so afraid of the possibility of social rejection. And so the thing that's really, really interesting about social anxiety disorder is that if you make it to adulthood without it, you're pretty much in the clear, okay? So that means that if um, you are an adolescent and you get it, then you're sort of in this very sensitive time period. Adult onset social anxiety disorder is extremely rare. That means that there's something unique and special about adolescence that allows this kind of illness to manifest. So what we want to do is we want to try to understand what puts certain people at risk for social anxiety disorder so that we can develop treatments and interventions that can really prevent these symptoms before they happen. And in that way, people can go on and have a more normative development and really learn how to successfully navigate that social world. So in my lab, we're really interested in identifying the brain-based mechanisms that are associated with risk for social anxiety disorder. So what does that look like? So we can imagine a couple of kids that are on their first day of junior high and they are approaching the school and both of them look pretty nervous on the outside. Well, we think that maybe there are a few different things going on on the inside. Maybe there are things happening in the brain of one child that can put them at risk for social anxiety disorder that's not happening in the brain of, of another child. And so along with my colleagues uh, at uh, NIH, including Eric Nelson, Danny Pine, and Nathan Fox, we came up with a way to actually test this. So what we do is we bring people in to our laboratory and we ask them to attend our virtual school. So it's very similar like a first day of school. They learn that the kids they're gonna interact with have different kinds of reputations. They can be nice, they can be bullies, they can be unpredictable. And then they go ahead and, and interact with these different kids. Now, the trick to all of this and what makes it really interesting is that these interactions are all happening while they're undergoing functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. And because of this, we can actually see what's going on in the brains of children as they anticipate and receive different types of social feedback from their peers. And what we've found so far is that among kids who are at risk for uh, anxiety due to being very shy when they're, when they're little, that these kids have much greater brain activity in regions associated with salience processing, with threat detection, specifically when they're anticipating unpredictable peer feedback. So not when they're waiting to get bullied, not when they're waiting to get positive feedback, but specifically when they don't know what's gonna happen. And so what we're hoping to do is pursue this line of research with other forms of, uh, of risk for social anxiety. And one of these forms of risk that I'm particularly interested in is peer victimization. And so we're hoping to bring kids into the lab and see what happens in their brain as we actually um, expose them to a bullying situation. So where they're receiving negative feedback from peers who are of higher status.
And we're hoping to use all of this information, again, in order to develop interventions that really target specifically the neural mechanisms that are implicated in, um, in this increased risk for psychopathology. If we can develop these interventions, then we have a very good chance of allowing kids who would otherwise really struggle as they're going through this critical phase of development in order to help them kind of have a more normal developmental trajectory.